the Institute for European Studies. Um, next week, uh, Valentine's Day, we're having two events on Valentine's Day. One is our ever popular fourth annual Valentine's Day uh, Bake Off. So hopefully some of you got information about that and come join us uh, at, uh, at 1.30 on Valentine's Day afternoon. And before that, we've got a really interesting talk by uh, Dr. Richard Fogarty, who's a historian at the University of Albany on uh, France, Germany, and the Muslim world and the struggle for empire, 1914 and 1918. So uh, that'll be a, kind of a double header next Friday if, if, you, if you're available uh, noon and, uh, for the talk and then the Bake Off afterwards. Uh, and then uh, I hope that you'll check out our website for other, other upcoming events as well. Um, so thank you all for coming uh, to hear today. Our speaker is uh, Professor Sarah Wallace Goodman, um, coming from sunny Southern California to frigid, um, uh, snowy Indiana. So we thank her for that. I had to buy a hat. She had to buy a hat at the airport, um, or at the that come from your hotel room? <laughs> I made it as far as Starbucks to the high street, and I was like, oh my, I need a hat. <laughs> yeah. So. Urban outfitter. <laughs> there you go. It's a local, local retailer. Right, yeah. <laughs> Supporting local business. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm really glad Sarah's somebody I, I thought of when I was trying to find think about speakers this year who would appeal to different audiences, um, especially uh, a lot of people here at I, IU who are interested in topics of immigration, uh, public policy, um, uh, uh, some work on you know ethnicity and diversity in especially in Western Europe and in Europe in general. And she does work in that area. Um, she is uh, assistant professor at the, in political science at the University of California, Irvine, working on the politics of citizenship, immigration, integrate immigrant integration, national identity, and immigration policy making. Um, she's the author of the forthcoming um, Cambridge University Press book. Civic Integration and Membership Policies in Europe, and her work has appeared in World Politics, where it's won several awards, uh, including uh, the James Christoph, James B. Christoph Award, and Jim Christoph was a political scientist here at IU for many years, so uh, that's an IU connection there. Um, West European Politics, World Politics, Political Studies, and the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies. So thanks very much, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. and to IU and Tim uh, for having me in your winter wonderland. Um, I am from the Midwest originally, so I, I, I still enjoy the nostalgia of snow. They probably hate me for calling it that. But uh, it is nice to sort of take it in for about 24 hours and fly home. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here today to present my forthcoming book uh, on civic, civic integration policies in Europe. Uh, so I want to start with that. What is civic integration? It's sort of a strange term. It's a new term. Um, and it embodies sort of three really innovative new concepts. Uh, not so innovative from the American perspective, but really new in the European context. Uh, the first thing that defines civic integration is the idea, just the idea alone, that active and productive participation is possible through acquiring citizen-like skills. So not only is that idea new on the European plane, but the idea that the state is going to play a role in seeing that immigrants obtain these skills. Uh, these skills are also new, country knowledge, language, and values, that by obtaining these values, immigrants can unlock the key to political, social, economic participation. And third, that these integration, the, the use of new instruments to assess those skills, um, tests, courses, integration contracts, integration oaths, uh, become mandatory, become conditions for the processes of entry, obtaining permanent residence or settlement, and naturalization or obtaining citizenship. So civic integration is really novel across all these areas. The idea, the instruments, the purpose, and the role that the state is playing to ensure integration, which is really where we can uh, contrast with existing integration policies, if you have questions about that uh, later. Um, so in order, so given this kind of new policy phenomena, this new idea, I wanted to be able to uh, understand um, sort of the descriptive plane, what, what this practice looked like across, across nationally. Um, in order to do so, I developed an index, a policy index, to literally count and measure civic integration policy practices across the EU-15. Uh, I did so in two different time periods, so 1997 is the first snapshot, uh, which I chose because um, 1998 was when we saw the first civic integration policy take place. The Dutch invented it, and it was in 
implemented in 98, so I took the snapshot year before uh, in order to understand kind of what, what practices resembling civic integration were even in place, and then um, a policy snapshot in 2013, so uh, contemporarily. Um, what civics conveys, this, it's a sort of an additive index from zero to nine, um, it doesn't convey the difficulty of requirements, it just conveys the robustness, how many requirements there are. Um, I make it a, a point to distinguish the two because you can't really determine how difficult a policy is unless you examine it in practice. Uh, take, for example, a language requirement in France where the majority of immigrants already speak French is not as difficult as a language requirement in Germany where the majority of immigrants do not speak German. So this merely counts policies. It, it conveys the robustness, the number of requirements. So in 1997, we look across the EU 15, and we see really sort of like practices. What existed was really um, Germany had a sort of a vague integration requirement. Language can be used as a requirement for permanent residence, but it wasn't uh, systematically assessed. Um, a lasting orientation in Spain, language but not assessed in Ger or in the UK. So there were sort of um, the in some of the instruments were already there, even though the purpose was different. Uh, in Germany, for example, the language policy was used to uh, a dialect test was used to distinguish uh, whether uh, an ethnic someone was ethnically German or not coming from the east. This is different than the kind of language test used today to determine whether an immigrant has integrated or not. So it was a selection mechanism, not an integration mechanism. So in 1997, we really see that among any practicing uh, of these sort of, um, instruments, they were really light, nothing over the two mark. By, by 2013, this picture alters dramatically. And we see a number of countries with very robust practices. Um, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, Austria, uh, France, Britain, uh, increasingly Italy, Greece, these are sort of late commerce, 2009, 2010. Uh, and so we see this really different empirical picture take place. Uh, to look at it more um, at, at the number specifically, we see drastic change in a number of countries, right? Uh, but a number of countries don't change at all or change very little, right? So this painted kind of a number of interesting puzzles for me, things I just wanted to know. Um, what explains the policy change, right? Just kind of a basic descriptive question, right? What explains why, why states went, you know, from two to seven, or you know, what, or, or, you know, two to five, right? What explains just the, the change itself? Uh, existing accounts of the civic integration policy turn, or the civic turn as it became called, uh, were either diffuse, they were inexact, they were reductive, uh, things like, well, it's welfare state entrenchment. Uh, well, it's immigration. It's the far right. Um, so those are certainly background and contextually important, but they're more determinative, right? Um, or the far right might be sufficient in some cases, but not necessary, right? And so I really kind of wanted to get at these explanations, more clo look more closely at them, uh, and see, well, what is it that, that was really driving this policy change? Uh, and then the second question that, that stemmed from that was, well, what accounts for what I see is actually a diversity policy change. So all these states were changing, all these states were adopting these instruments of language assessment and country knowledge, but they were doing it really differently. They were designing their programs really differently. Um, they had a different uh, um, sanctions attached to these policies, and these policies had drastically different effects. And so, uh, the literature didn't really address the notion of diversity at all. They kind of were really satisfied with this just this idea of change. So change, you know, we see change, therefore we see convergence. States are replacing national models with civic integration. And we're doing away with integration policy or bringing civic integration. But I, I sort of just even a, a scant glance at how states were doing this revealed that they were doing it quite differently. And I wanted to delve more into that puzzle. Um, and then finally, I guess relatedly, is all policy adoption created equal? So are they doing it for the same reasons? Same instruments, but questioning whether for the same purpose. Uh, and then what about the effects? So the, the seconds are related. So not only do I ask sort of three questions in the book, but I provide them three different answers. So what explains policy change? I argue that states address membership problems 
in a context of existing citizenship policy and party politics. So there are, citizenship gets thrown into the debate, membership gets problematized, uh, that's kind of an antecedent condition here, but states are addressing this question in totally different policy contexts and with really different dynamics of politics. Um, where in some states you have grand coalitions and in other states you have federalism playing a role, that these policy contexts matter. And, and variation in these variables or these conditions drive the, diver, the variation, drive the diversity of policy. So where you have consensus versus polarization, where you have left in power versus right in power. So this draws on some of the extant political explanations for citizenship policy, but uh, nuances them in a context um, of institutional uh, path dependence. And then finally, I provide an explanation that policy isn't all created equal. The evidence shows that states adopt similar instruments for different reasons, different designs, and different effects. And I'm going to try and focus on all those areas today. I'm going to ambitiously try and present four case studies. We'll see how far I get. Uh, so um, I, I, mean, I include this slide for the benefit of graduate students out there, just to try and show uh, what the research Tim had mentioned that there's sort of a methodological bent. Um, so I want to kind of paint what the, this is the table of contents from the book to show kind of the progression of the research design itself from concept to measurement to case study. Uh, so the idea that states are introducing civic integration policies, right? Um, civic integration is a, is a policy proxy for membership. And so I first address this question of membership, why membership matters, why states invest in membership, and why membership becomes a problem. From then I talk about how I measure membership, and I talk about the Civic Integration Policy Index. Then I go on to explain those aforementioned puzzles about um, why states adopt, why they adopt diversely or differently, uh, and focusing on two context, or two variables, institutional uh, path dependent context and party politics. Um, and then I move to case studies, and I do three paired comparisons for a reason. Okay. Um, All right, I'll get to that in a second, um, where I show you why I do three paired comparisons of two case studies each. Uh, so first I'll, I'll briefly go through the, um, the question of membership, why it matters. I mean, civic integration is pretty neat, you know, if you kind of like studying tests and national identity, but why do states care about membership? Well, um, sort of historically, the nationalism literature tells us that citizenship is membership. That having citizenship, having a passport, having an identity in the state conveys that you're a member of that state. Empirically, we know that there are differences, that there, are, there is difference between citizenship and membership, where people have a passport but don't feel like they belong in the national political community, or people feel like they have ties to a national political, political community but don't have status. So we see that there are, you can have unique relationships to the state uh, where these two are not tied together. So, uh, and in fact, what what became very prevalent in my interview with um, policymakers is this idea that citizenship does not convey membership. That was the problem. The policy, con the ge membership policy was generated in the context of problematizing citizenship as an identity. So, citizenship uh, is defined as a status, right? It's a category of legal rights, um, obligations. It's the instrument that states use to allocate resources, achieve democratic legitimacy, surveillance, etc. Membership does different things, and that's why states care about membership, or have become increasingly concerned about whether citizenship conveys membership or not. Because membership conveys social or it conveys a sense of belonging, it establishes social cohesion, fosters common group goals, builds loyalty. Um, traditionally, in Europe, this has been this has occurred through a national identity. I make the case that what civic integration promotes is a sort of alternative identity, a type of state identity where you can belong to the political community um, without the ties to the nation. So whereas national identity is defined by the logic of sameness, state identity is driven by the logic of togetherness. This is the kind of language prevalent in um, sort of how, what Tony Blair would describe right after the 7-7 uh, bombings as um, the problem, he said, in, in relation to the bombers who didn't, you know, who were all British citizens, right? We never gave them a narrative of Britishness that they wanted to belong to. 
uh, right? So really taking on some of the responsibility in that there was not this sort of shared sense of common purpose, that you can be a country defined by diversity uh, with common goals or common ties that can um, hold together um, what Trevor Phillips referred to as parallel lives. So this kind of identity promoted through civic integration is something really unique and which really marks the sort of projects happening in Europe now as historically distinct. So given that states care about membership, and membership comes up as the problem of citizenship, again, like I said, the citizenship debate itself being this antecedent condition. Uh, so citizenship gets politicized. Given it's politicized, what is the context in which states are discussing citizenship, right? That they problematize membership. And so what I do is I look at the conditions of policy adoption and policy and the first adaptation. So what this shows is just the first change to that policy. You could continue mapping the conditions for T2, T3, T4, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, in my World Politics article, uh, I take just the first time snapshot, right? It's sort of a static two by two, but these are really fluid variables. This is a dynamic process. Uh, where conditions change, governments change, policy itself can change as well. So I really wanted to look at the, the trajectory of that policy and how it's informed by these contexts, and, and, and by, by context and by politics. So what we're looking at here is, these are all high civic score countries. All these countries have very robust civic integration policies. But you'll see that they start policy adoption in really different circumstances. We see left governments, we see right governments. This just here's a left-right orientation score of government. Uh, and really different citizenship scores, or um, concepts of citizenship. Up here we're seeing the more inclusive citizenship countries. Uh, residency periods are low. Uh, they allow for dual citizenship. Um, you can maybe get citizenship through uh, for, uh, W solely, or so uh, your parents are born in the country, but then you're born in the country, you get the citizenship. So those are the more inclusive citizenship countries, and these are the more exclusive citizenship countries. Higher residency periods, um, a renunciation requirements on your second citizenship, etc. And so I really looked at these different contexts, and I wanted to test if they were meaningful. Um, not just at the point of origin, but at the point of adaptation. So here they are. Okay. So this, you know, this traditionally, right? You could two by two it, right, if you reduce the complexity of the variables. But I really want to, you know, I was advising graduate school, you have variation, keep the variation, preserve the variation. So I really wanted to kind of see, well, you know, what's really happening in a kind of fluid, dynamic setting. And so in the first pair of comparison, I look at the effects of policy context. And here we see Austria and Denmark, similar citizenship policy very closed understanding of inclusion through citizenship, very different political, uh, very different governments. And what we see in these case studies is citizenship plays a very important role in constraining the debate, where both the left and the right understand belonging as very similar, regardless of their orientation, right, or what we would expect, um, you know, left, we, uh, the literature tells us left governments are meant to promote inclusion, right governments promote exclusion, right, de-ethnicizing, re-ethnicizing, we actually see that their understanding of what it means to de-ethnicize is really narrow, and they're very quite, I mean, they're quite similar. So here we have a pair of comparison where the citizenship policy is similar, and we see how similar, a close understanding really constrains the behavior of parties. Um, in a second pair of comparison, I sort of do the inverse of that. I look at similar government orientations where we have a left government that's heavily influenced by the right. Um, in very different citizenship contexts, and then we see how those contexts, those citizenship policy contexts or understandings of belonging, really inform different outcomes, different membership strategies, where what we see in the UK is far more liberal, far more inclusive and individual oriented, versus that which we see in Germany, which is very state directed, difficult, um, and conditional. Uh, and then the third sort of variation that is interesting is in this third pair comparison, where not only are the policy contexts similar, the government orientation similar, you have a very left party in power, then you have a right party in power with a significant role of the far right. So 
theoretically, right, that should produce the same kind of outcome. But looking at this pair comparison shows the effects of causal mechanisms. So the process in which these two variables interact produce very different outcomes because the causal mechanisms vary. And I'm going to look at more closely at that um, to show sort of the effects of a far-right party in uh, what I call layering versus polarizing. That, they, that far right parties have different effects in these countries and therefore yield different mechanisms by which we see membership policy outcomes. Okay, so I'm uh, not going to do the Austria-Denmark case today. Well, because I think it's a little over ambitious to do six case studies uh, in the talk. But it, you know, it's sort of the, it's the most expected, the, the sort of least interesting right, uh, case study where we would expect citizens, you know, right-oriented governments, or we would, uh, even left-oriented governments in Denmark to pursue kind of restrictive, um, arduous, and in the end, ultimately very dense and difficult membership requirements. Uh, the more interesting case studies are where we see sort of uh, variable outcomes here. So uh, here we see two different countries. This is just reiterating what uh, I just showed you with really different citizenship policies, which reflect different understandings of belonging. Um, citizenship in, in Germany heavily informed by this idea of national identity versus the almost complete absence of a national identity in the UK. Um, very uh, similar government ideological orientations where you have left parties in power that are heavily influenced by the right, the left being uh, both being a function of the institutional setting, the left being uh, sort of the role of um, the, the role of the, the state level uh, administrations, but also um, would turn out to be sort of consequential majority by the right of the Bundesrat. Uh, on the right, you're seeing sort of uh, as a function of the single actor system, the left party being heavily influenced by the right and addressing sort of this constant angst about immigration and public opinion. And then I just included the far right in there to kind of to show that, it, to remind us all that it doesn't exist in, in these cases. Therefore, it's kind of a sufficient but not necessary condition. Um, and they yield very different membership policy outcomes, different configurations of civic integration policy. Uh, and what we're really focusing on here is the role that citizenship plays in informing those differences. Because uh, policymakers in each state have different understanding of what it means uh, uh, to propose uh, acceptable amendments to citizenship, and what it means to have an appropriate change that affects membership policy. So. Uh, beginning with Germany, I'm going to sort of uh, move briefly through these. I'm going to look at policy adoption, adaption, adaptation, sorry, uh, then not just policy output, but then policy outcomes. I'm going to try and do that with the cases here. And there's a little flag on the bottom right, so we can remind ourselves which case we're looking at in case I fail to put it in the title. So in looking at the conditions of adoption in 1999, the Citizenship Act was really um, sort of the, the exciting first policy change of the new left government. Uh, the SPD Green Coalition came into power after a long tradition of conservative rule, and one of their first goals was to change citizenship. And they had all these goals to liberalize it, right? Dual citizenship, lowered residency requirements. And the right was, mm, I don't think so. And while the right was in opposition, they had significant leverage because they controlled some of the more influential state-level governments, right? And then, like I said later, they became the majority, they held the majority in the Bundesrat. Uh, so for the, co for the left coalition to gain some of the really important liberalizations that occurred in the 1999 Citizenship Act, namely um, the reduction of residency, the possibility of use solely uh, after 18 years, uh, you get to give up one citizenship and uh, sort of pick your loyalty, uh, what's called the options model. Uh, in exchange for some of those really big gains, they had integration price tags, right? They had significant costs. One, they had to give up dual citizenship, right? This idea of dual citizenship, they had to give up. A second one was integration, that the, the, the opposition demanded that they include something about language uh, or um, uh, what was it? loyalty, right? Uh, lasting orientation and loyalty. Uh, so that was kind of a, a small compromise um, that the left didn't really mind so much because in the end they kind of got their big gains. Um, now, right after that was adopted though, literally, a couple weeks later they started talking about integration, right? So they got this out of the way and then they're like, 
Now we can focus on integration. Um, and what we saw is two parties, one on the left, one on the right, with sort of what we would predict is really different interests, had the exact same goal, right? They both wanted to promote integration. They both wanted to make some integration mandatory, language, uh, civic orientation classes, uh, but they had different um, approaches, right? So the goal was the same, but the, uh, the means varied. So uh, the CDU thought that uh, it should be individually led, that the government, oh, sorry, the CDU said uh, it should be uh, government led versus uh, the SPD thought that it should be individually led. Um, they had two different commissions set up to discuss uh, how to achieve integration among immigrants. The government commission focused on practicality, right? How are we going to provide these classes? How are we going to sustain an education system for all the immigrants? And the right focused on the symbolism, right? The light culture, uh, the notion of belonging and identity. Right? So they had these, and, and that, that sort of counter commission, right, against the government commission really brought the issue to the fore of the public agenda and influenced the ultimate outcome. Ultimately, both commissions proposed the exact same policy, 600 hours of language, 30 hours of civic um, orientation classes, a test, and an oath, right? Uh, in the end, they came to the exact same conclusion um, embodied in the Immigration Act, and, which then only became more robust under successive CDU -like governments. So we saw how citizenship really informed, or an understanding of what was possible in terms of membership, really informed both parties on the left, on the right, to reach the same outcome. Uh, what the policy looked like in the end, on balance, was a really significant barrier to inclusion. Uh, I say on balance because there are some positive sanctions that were tied to integration. It's not as difficult, I mean, I say difficult having both now both the outcomes and output, but not as difficult as in Austria or Denmark. Um, I can go into sort of reasons and the questions if, you, if you're curious about how it's, it's easier um, or, or, or how there are more positive sanctions tied to it. But on balance, it's still significantly um, exclusive. So formally, it's exclusive through fees. You have to pay for those integration courses, uh, not just fees, but time, right? I mean, 900 hours, that's not like an hour in, on a clock. That's a clock, by the way. <laughs> right? It's hours as in a unit. So 900 units of a class could take you years to complete of a German language B2 level, which is the equivalent of 301 if you took German here. Think how long, as an adult, it would take you to reach that level of language, right? Um, fines, if you don't complete the requirements, you either pay in a timely manner, you either pay fines or you get denied a permanent residence visa. Um, but also, it has these really interesting ties to benefits. Uh, so you can't get permanent residence if you if you have a dependency on benefits, um, if if you have benefit, uh, demonstrate what's called benefit utilization, um, you can't so you can't get permanent residence. But you can get those benefits before permanent residence. So it creates this kind of dependency loop, where you enjoy the benefits of the social welfare, you enjoy the social welfare benefits, um, but without completing integration, you can't get status. Without status, then you then lose those benefits. Um, you also get suspension of the benefits if you don't complete it in a timely manner. So you can sort of see how these are all tied to each other in a very complicated way that really uh, sort of deprives an immigrant of the security of status, right? It creates a sort of, a, a, it maintains a type of vulnerability that I think can be really detrimental um, to someone's ultimate integration, which is to thrive in a permanent community. So uh, in terms of looking at, at outcomes, where do we see it as a restrictive barrier? So it's not particularly restrictive at entry. I mean, actually, it, it can be quite restrictive, uh, depending from, I suppose, which side of the percentage you're looking at. Uh, if you take a language course in your country of origin at the Goethe Institute, which is how they run these um, tests, if you take the language course, you're more likely to pass than if you don't take the language course. To take the language course, though, usually costs an immigrant, on average, their monthly salary. So there's a prohibition, right? Uh, you know, a prohibitive cost right there. Uh, without the course, or the 61% pass rate, right? And that's per year. Uh, citizenship is not surprising, right? It has a 99% pass rate. This is a 33 question test you take to obtain citizenship. Um, and pass rates are obviously very high for, for that. Uh, it's really settlement where you see the, the greatest barrier of all, right? Not only is it tied to that 
uh, the benefits. Not only is it um, you know, connected to that dependency loop, but we see really low pass rates. Uh, among uh, the test takers, so you have to take a course, um, and then at the end of the course you take a cumulative test. Uh, we see consist really low and consistently low pass rates, uh, improving slightly among course graduates, um, but for those who don't take the course, significantly low. Right? So remember, if you don't pass the integration in a timely manner, then you can get reduction on your benefits, right? uh, which then only prohibits you even further from potentially thriving. Right? So you can